All right, Bobby, we're live. Wonderful. We're live. I'm just gonna. Yeah. Uh, have gonna you? Share yeah, you gotta pop. Share it on Twitter, and Telegram. Yeah. Uh, I guess the if you can do anything with that information is that the there's a reason why elite theory in Italy hasn't been uh, understood in the same way that we understand it in the West. Uh, you know, it's more like flow. You know, it's less less of an ideology and more of a flow. Or like, yeah, things work that way, but you know, uh, <laughs> works nine to five. Oh shit! I'm very loud. I'm gonna make my audio a little bit less loud. Let's see, maybe this will be better. Oh man, it's been a minute since we've done this. Yeah. Probably. But yeah, I was. Uh, Probably with this. We we so... had to take a we had to take a break because of the uh, the Nashville event. But we're back. <laughs> Bobby, I wonder if there's, like, just some dude who is just not even in the dissident, right? He just wanted a Let's Play for, for Sir Bronte, and he just he just found it. He found our live streams. <laughs> He's just been watching what? all of them. I don't know. I mean, did you see that you gained, like, around 50 subscribers since we've started doing who, this stream? Who would have thought being active on a YouTube channel gets people interested in your YouTube yeah, channel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, but, you know, there's, like... Like, there are parties that don't exist due to, uh, like, some political leaning. They just exist as, like, fan clubs. I mean, you know that, but so you true. really know that once you participate in something similar like that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was cool. And but Rome looks weird. Rome has, like, this big bucket of skid row that has been thrown upon it and, like, spilled all over the city. But there are still some pockets that have relatively like little to no people in them, and the people that they do have are just Italians, or, like white, you know, like the the parks and all that stuff. Fortune, uh, Italians, white. Oh yeah, well yeah yeah. I mean, come on, Rome. When it comes to it, <laughs> but it's 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 going to be pretty white people. But yeah, it's. Uh, it was definitely something, and uh, I wish I'll probably go back there. I liked it. Um, I just didn't like how many places spoke no Italian. You know, I like. I thought, oh man, I'm gonna go to this lamb cafe, and then I'm gonna talk the ears off the guy who works there. He'll love it, and then he'll let me charge my phone and like the battery. Oh man, it's gonna be great. I open the fucking door. And it's an illegal Chinese gambling den where mm -hmm. no one speaks Italian, you know. <laughs> and they have this massive poker table in front of the fire escape. Uh, and I was thinking, man, an Italian would never do this because he'd be pissing and shitting himself over the police walking in. Over the, you know, the police that always exist. Because that's what kind of fa the, the fascist man is. The man that doesn't need laws because he carries all the laws with him. The laws were, um, the laws were written on his heart, Bobby. Yeah, That's the his... new covenant, where the laws are written on man's heart. I don't know. With the time, it's probably on his dick. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Italians, uh... we're gonna we're gonna get started here, but Italians have a weird sense of sexual morality. Um, yeah, and... it's it's very strange. And it's not that they don't have any sense of sexual morality. It's just that they have a weird sense of sexual morality, like. Yeah. They'll kill someone over violating their sister, but they'll violate other sisters at will. Yeah, well, well, that's the thing that you can. There is this game, you know. At, so Jordan Peterson, in a very, very old interview, I think it's like six or seven years ago, he was talking about flirting, and he said, "Well, that like you can flirt with people, and for the sake of flirting, not for the sake of like attracting." 
some biological like mate, which kind of goes against his background as in what is it, evolutionary psychologist, where like you know even makeup is to signal your maturity or something. And but he was like, oh yeah, you know I flirt, like I like flirting. It's like cool. Um, and I mean, you know, I I don't get it. Uh, I mean, like to me, flirting is uh, a way to gain a mate. It's not just like bullshit like small talk but for him it is and for italians it absolutely is and it breaks some people's brains like it is not something that can just be like advised to people to do you know you can't just say oh we'll just be like an an italian in your everyday life uh and yeah i but but it's cool you know they, they were very nice to me uh and in fact they've begun sort of uh, they began seeing me as like an Italian or a Sicilian or whatever. They because uh, you know I was talking to them I was like, well, y- you will have to kind of do this and that and like yeah, like collapse and like technical collapse is already here. It's happening and they're like, well, what do you mean we'll have to? You'll have to as well. You're gonna stay here. You're not going back to Russia. And I thought, well, damn, <laughs> like yeah. And then he, the, the leader guy, took me with him when he was driving me back home. And we hung a, a poster on the on the road that has been being, uh, no, has been kind of uh, building, has been being built, <laughs> is being built for like at least, what, 10 years? And oh. it should have been built seven years ago. They had a timeline of three years, and they didn't do it. They and so we we like hung a poster, which is like for shame, for shame. And then the kind of the dissident sources in Italy picked it up and said the Kazapong militants hung a poster. You know these brave men <laughs> went there. Oh, it was very funny. It was like it was like one one in the morning, and there were like five cars passing us by, and we were on the. Autobahn or whatever, like this big road. Bobby, <laughs> like, are you uh, are you sure this won't get the Italian police to knock on your door? Nah, nah, nah. It's you know. what are the the, the carabinieri? Is that is that what they're called or? Uh, well, carabinieri is more like a, the FBI. It's weird. Like if 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 you want to see fascist police, look at the carabinieri. Look no further than carabinieri because they are present in every little village, every little city, every little town. And they change every two to four years, so they rotate. So you can't like stay there and become part of the that's, community. So you know that's how the um that's how the how should I say that's how the U.S. Army rotates its active duty officers. They rotate. You know, if you're in the United States Army and you're active duty, you're pretty much rotated every two three years, um, as a matter of course. And this is very much an imperial tactic. They do this with officers and with men in a unit, so they can ensure that no unit starts becoming more loyal to their officer than to this abstract concept of the United States. Um, however, this does not happen with the U.S. Now, they, they also do that with the FBI things. You know, assignments get rotated. So, yeah, you're right. People can't form emotional bonds with the communities they're in. Um, but, you know, like, like, like this is different with the National Guard, which I don't know if there's an Italian equivalent. Um which is regionalized military. Um, you could have the same people in a unit for 20, 30 years. And yeah, we just have American bases here, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, you've got a Vincenzo Air Force Base. That's where uh, the 173rd Airborne Brigade is. In Sicily? Yeah, or... it's, it's, not in, it's not in Sicily. No, I think it's in northern Italy. Um, oh, but yeah, the 173rd is, our, um, uh, is one of our two... QRFs slash triggers in Europe. Um, the other one is Second Armored Cavalry Regiment. That's up in, um, I think they're in Ansbach, Germany. Um, yeah, and 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 two ACR is a is a heavy striker brigade, um, and one seventy third is a light airborne brigade, and two ACR's role in NATO's grand strategy in Europe should Russia come west is to uh, basically buy us two hours. The Baltic states are meant to buy us about 35 minutes. 
Yeah. Well, um, uh, there's a military base in close to me, and we see Chinooks flying. Yeah. Uh, once in a while, and we even saw an Osprey. So. Bobby, I wonder, I wonder what would happen if you know. And we're gonna get started here. We've been sitting here on the on the yeah. YouTube screen. Well, for well, a it's while. fine. Look, we have a lot to talk about. Yes, sir. You know. <laughs> so, yeah, but um, yeah. I know. I wonder. I wonder if after, if there is some sort of. I don't want to. I I don't like the word collapse because it never really goes that way. Um, until it does, and then when it does, it was like you know, everything else has already happened. But if there was ever some sort of you know rapid system collapse that all of the u.s soldiers in europe would become like roving warlord bands kind of like the normans <laughs> were um which to be honest i'm here for i think it'd be <laughs> cool you know if you've got these my random... couch anytime yeah. Yeah. yeah definitely well well if, well, if uh, look if sicily becomes the new byzantium you're definitely welcome to come build your house here on the on this fucking you know fuck off massive territory so. all righty so let's this is just yeah. kind of a recapitulation of what we did last week you know well one second before the recapitulation i gotta mm -hmm. ask you about sildings you know? okay yeah i'll, I'll... T tell me about like yeah i'll talk a little I'll talk a little bit about it. I'll probably talk about it um, more during the stream too. But I mean, it was it was great. We showed up, you know, just massive. I'm telling you what, Bobby, like the the concentrated autism that was in this room. It is it is it is bewildering. Like you can feel the energy, you know. <laughs> you can and, smell it in the air. Well, you know, for example, it's like you know people were showing up, and I was walking up to them, and I'm like, "Are you here for Super Racism Con 9000?" Um, you know, are you or are you here for Hitler convention or something like that? <laughs> and, you know, like, you know, and you could always tell I could always like like just by looking at them, I could tell who was with us and who wasn't with us. There were some borderline cases, but, you know, yeah, there were there was, you know, people from all age ranges, age ranges, Ooh. people from like, I'd assume, you know, their teens, late teens to about their early 60s it was it was it was a huge collection mostly people right about at that midpoint 20s 30s um mm. we had a 100 percent increase in women from last year damn we went yeah, from that... we went from two women last year to four women this year you know the you're you're a hose magnet oh i like, know it's good because, because you're married Right? Well, it's I mean, like... I didn't bring her, um, but I am going to bring her yeah, next we'll, year. Yeah, well, she's pregnant. So. Yeah, well, I mean, well, not, I mean, for the five people watching that, that news is now leaked to the dissident right world. Um, <laughs> Wait, you haven't told? Oh, man, I'm Bobby, sorry. No, it's, guess... okay. it's, it's all right, Bobby. I mean, you know, I, I, I try not to, I don't like to make my life a spectacle for yeah. the dissident right you know what i mean I, I try to i try to keep my personal life i can i'll mention yeah, yeah. it i'll mention it without any like compunctions but you know i try to i try to wait a long time to mention it and i try to like you know have it be its own self-contained thing that you know the yeah dissident i'll right. be more careful next time i know it's all good man i mean you know it, oh, shit like like how many people watch this stream <laughs> but still um but yes, she is, uh, and you know, and um, um, I don't know, man. How is how is Ryan? Okay, so Ryan is Ryan. All right, he is he is a fervid young individual. Um, you know, so Ryan and I we're both really high energy guys um, in different ways. Um, I wouldn't say, well, I don't know if that's, Ryan's very high energy. I am, I've been told I'm high energy when I get excited, so I, I don't fucking know. But Ryan and I, we, we, we kind of have two different impulses um, that stem from the same source. You know, my impulse is to, you know, go around. I can't really tell anyone no, and, um, uh, and, and Ryan can't really, uh, you know, he, let's let's just say, anyone, yes. let's just let's just say that there's a reason it was him who started off a massive confrontation with the Lutheran Church. Oh. Um, 
and that's not and that's not to dis, to dismerge his character. You know, a disagreeable nature is very useful, and I'm not. I'm not, you know, I'm just, I'm just kind of speaking the facts here. You know, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want this to be construed as me talking about, about Ryan. Ryan is my very good friend. I like Ryan quite a bit. Um, no, but you know, he was, Ryan was great. He was, you know, he was there with the Carsons as always. And, you know, I, uh, and, um, I can't remember if he, if he spoke or not. Um, cause last year. Yeah. Ryan did. spoke. Yeah. What was his, I'm trying to remember what his speech was. About. It's. You know, as soon as you leave the conference, like, I can't remember half the speakers, Bobby. I don't, you know, I don't know. I know Curtis spoke this year and last year. Um, Curtis Yarvin? No, uh, that's a, that's a, <laughs> not me, not you. Um, other yeah, other yeah, people yeah. like that. Um, shoot, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, shit, Bobby, this is, you're trying to make me remember it's six in the morning. Come on. <laughs> no, but um, uh, but um, but oh yeah, now now people are posting about it on Twitter. <laughs> what oh, are they no. posting? Oh no, just 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 the news. Um, but it's all good. Um, thank you, thank you very much, for whomever you know, for those of you who are who are watching the stream. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Um, but yeah, yeah, Bobby, it was it was. I'm sorry I don't have a high a much higher energy recap because it was the the event which was outstanding lots of cigars were smoked I was up till 4 in the morning several nights um just talking about just various autistic spurgy stuff um, Was AA present this no. Sildings? No. A was not present Curtis Yarvin was not present um No Nick Land either Unfortunately all three fell Damn. through not for lack of trying of course um we'll get Nick Land one day uh, yeah, once definitely. we get Nick Land, it'll be over. Um, he'll just come in with a little box, uh, and then he like opens it. The whole room implodes. Yes, that's 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 that is in fact what Nick Land does. Nick Land in reality, he's a very nice. Um, he's a nice older English professor who just you know doesn't want to doesn't want to be uh you know doesn't want to be a bother to anyone. Um, but um. But yeah, no, Skildings was great. Uh, I've said that I think five times, but you know, George Bagby was there selling used books of various kinds. We had Imperium Press there selling a bunch of their special edition hardcover books. Uh, we had, uh, we had, I'm trying to remember what else. There, I mean, you know, we had a local tobaccoist come, which was selling cigars <laughs> for five bucks a pop. He was also sitting there watching all wow. of our speeches. We had people bringing their Normicon brothers who were kind of based but just hadn't read up on stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, we had um, uh, we had people, like I said, we had people bringing... Last year, the one woman that went there last year, um, she actually got engaged to one of the dudes that went there last year, too. So they both Yeah, I heard year. that. That's, that's crazy. So, so gentlemen... In the um uh, in the, in the chat right now we have a one hundred percent engagement rate for women who go to the and women too we have a one hundred percent engagement rate for women who go to uh, the Skildings conference <laughs> so you know I mean I can't speak for the future past odds can never be used to determine future odds but those are pretty good odds um, yeah, that's pretty cool but well, what was the NPM of the con of the you know surroundings NPM. Yeah, the N words per minute. Oh, sure, dude. It was <laughs> me alone. Me alone. It must have been like like fifteen. Um, I would just I would just straight up walk up to people and I would just say it. Um, I would just walk up to random to a random you know group of guys and I'd be like you know I just I just say it and then and we had a, for for some reason we had a very strange amount of Canadians there. There were a lot of Canadians there. Um, I guess it's because the COVID restrictions got lifted and they, they wanted to come cause they couldn't come last year, but they, uh, but they flew down and, you know, they were all very nice, you know, but, you know, basically they were like, yeah, we kind of need you to come up and, you know, conquer our country. Cause <laughs> you know, the, uh, the Canadian awesome. government is actually kind of terrible and we're really like dying up here. So, uh, you need to kind of come up here and save us. Um, that's that's me, you know. I, I basically I would just look at them and I'd just be like, you know, step one is we're gonna annex Canada 
if you know I'm God Emperor of the United States or whatever, I'm gonna go up and annex Canada. And they said, yeah, we kind of need it. Um, but you know, but the thing is, is like you know, I I I just drop, you know, I'm a Southern, I drop the hard R like it was nothing, <laughs> and. And they'd kind of have this shocked and like sort of excited look about their face, like, "Oh, you don't hear that too often up in uh, up in Vancouver, eh? Uh, they don't, they don't, we don't deal with too many of them up there." And you know, <laughs> well, when I stayed in uh, Rome in the little hostel, awful place, but when you come up to a person in this hostel and you say, "Man, what a shithole!" Right? That person becomes your friend. She like turns around. She's like, "Oh yeah, man. How long have you been here? How much did you pay?" And whatever. And and then you start talking to them. And I met an uh, an American guy from Missouri uh, who was studying finance. He was a finance bro. And we talked. Like I talked to him. His name was Nick. And I I got it in my head that Nick was not short for Nicholas. <laughs> he was short for the N word. <laughs> so. So he 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 appreciated that, you know. He appreciated my honesty towards him. But uh, I was like, um, yeah, it was. Uh, we just talked. I like asked him what was what was America like, and he was definitely, um, you know, he had some of our ideas. He was like, he was very comfortable with everything. He was twenty years old, and uh, it was it was pretty crazy just how. Um, I guess how accepting uh, he was of everything that I told him, uh, even though he wasn't like a redneck or whatever. Like he had a very, uh, what do you like, like an upper class American. He wasn't like German. Uh, he was more of a like English stock. Well, he was from. You said he was from Missouri. Studying Missouri, yeah. yeah. So Missouri. Missouri is like the one weird it's 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 the one state in the United States. You know, you could you could say this Bobby, all right? Missouri is kind of like a microcosm for the entire United States, just contained within the state. Um it has uh yeah. it has what's up? Uh, well, well, it has a 40,000 bounty on any policeman that tries to enforce uh, federal gun laws on its territory. It's true. It's true. But, you know, and Missouri's kind of great. But, like, you know, you look at Missouri, it's got a capital on a major body of water in the east, far in the east. No, wait, no, no, that St. Louis isn't the capital. Sorry. The J Jefferson City is the capital. Sorry, Missouri bros, I fucked up your state. Yeah, you can come fucking kill me. But St. Louis is basically the capital of Missouri. Um, um, but then, you know, like really, if you say someone is from Missouri, that could mean five different things. Because Missouri is the only state in the United States where you have Northerners, Southerners, Western Cowboys, you know, Ozark Hillbillies, and like Appalachians and freaking midwest germans all in one place you know mm -hmm. all in one state like if you say someone is from missouri that could really mean frick it really is like the borderland of the united states um mm. you know and, it's, it's and, the ukraine of the united states ukraine ukraine yeah exactly <laughs> slava ukraine um, yeah, um, yeah. M Missouri is just the Ukraine of the United States. Uh, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna get into a lot of trouble for that. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah. So actually, you know, fun fact. You know, T. S. Eliot, Bobby. Yeah. So he was from Missouri. He was born in St. Louis, Missouri. Ooh. To uh, to really waspy parents, um, and so T. S. Eliot is the is the cats guy. The cats guy. Yeah, he wrote the the poem book on which the uh, the Broadway play Cats musical was was based upon. Yeah, he he was uh, yeah he he was a playwright, um, but yeah he wrote the Wasteland and uh, the Four Quartets. Anyway, yeah, well, Bobby, I, I'm sure we'll talk. I'll talk more about Skildings on the stream, but we're like fucking twenty minutes in, and we. It's haven't played fine. Look, it was no twenty four minutes in, so it's it's okay. Uh, let's go ahead. The end of youth. Yes, so, you know, this is kind of, we kind of played through this last week, but basically what happened last week was that, or, well, two weeks ago, John Milton uh, gets honey-potted and betrayed, and the feds capture him, 
and uh, he outwits the feds, but you know he ends his youth. Um, you know he's and he's and he's done. He's done with his life in Anizate, or was it? Um, what is it? No, he's done with his life in the capital of Eterna, and he's gonna go back to his hometown of Anizate. Um, so yeah, you can see all the all the stuff we did. We're back in Kansas now. Yep, you know, Path of the Lotless, Alice's Rescue. We saved the Lotless. Let's look at our personality. We're pretty, we're pretty diplomatic. Kind of suck at fighting. We're theology autists. Kind of suck at talking. We're excellent at manipulating though, and we're pretty good at scheming. So, truly, John Milton, right here. John Milton. <laughs> John Trace. Milton, the dangerous one. We only have one death so far. Um you know our house kind of fucking sucks we're, we're we're doing okay and our family's go, doing all right but you know our friend thomas he he likes us sophia really likes us um he doesn't really care about us she she doesn't even know we exist nor does she um well, he hates us because he's a dick and uh, this is our boss our boss right up here um in terms of our family, granddad hates us. Our father doesn't really care. He thinks we're a disappointment. Uh, brother doesn't like us. Mom loves us. Uh, sister loves us. And our older brother is, you know, he kind of likes us. But it is it is what it is. But. Yeah, granddad is Polish now. He lives in the pipes. It's true. It's true. He does. He is, in fact, living in your walls. Uh um, in my walls. Let's go. Thus begins peacetime. A full adult now. Uh, I returned from old. the capital a changed man. Yet, my hometown was not the same as I had left it. Fate had difficult times in store for all of us. I love how medieval settings can't really, like, be a medieval setting without, like, throwing a bunch of 18th century shit into it. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Well, well, time. Go ahead. Tell tell you a secret, a big secret that I've been carrying for close to a month. I found another game for you, and this one's a doozy because it's called Penitence, and it's about the Martin Luther age, and it's kind of like Sir Bronte, uh, a little bit more point and clicky, but it's. It's pretty much that. It's made by uh, history artists at like Microsoft Studios, and it has paws in it, but it's 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 just on that line that it feels like realistic enough that this was like a real thing, uh, and everything forms its uh, so all of the circumstances form the kind of bucket for this for this pause, like a self-contained bucket for the pause. Uh, it is incredibly harsh. Uh, it's inc it's it's realistic to the point that it's boring sometimes, uh, and it's it's ridiculous. Like if you were to buy it, you would like just stop production on anything, and you would just sit there and like play it for like twenty or forty hours or whatever, trying to get every single ending. Uh, I don't think I could do that. Yeah, you can't. But we, we we will probably do it in the future, you know. But it's it's ridiculous. I, I couldn't I couldn't play the second chapter because it was too sad, basically. So yeah, it's 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 good. Um, and women are very realistic because they complain a lot. So, so true. So and true. And also don't. And also don't. Like there's this like schizo femininity there where like you have the two extremes. Um, but yeah. Oh, have you seen The Young Pope, the I TV have, series? I have not. It, it's very interesting, that's what I'd say. I don't know if it's good yet, I gotta finish it, but it's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> it's this Pope that comes into the um, church, and he's 47 years old. And instead of like being all liberal or whatever, he, he becomes ultra-fundamentalist. Like, like, seriously so. And he's played by Jude Law. Yeah, I've seen I've seen clips of it. 
um, you know, when he's, for example, when he talks about, like, the plate and all that, you know, he's well, like... Well, more than the plate, yeah. Of course, you've seen some uh, some of the clips, but it's just, uh, you know, he he's very, very... Uh, diabolical in his uh, in his ways he like he equates himself to Christ he is very very selfish he admits that he doesn't always believe in God and all that stuff but at the same time he and I mean obviously the music helps the camera work helps but sometimes like even a liberal would root for him Hmm. You know, he would be like, oh man, this is so good because the music is like telling me that this guy is good and the camera angles tell me that this guy is good and this guy is bad. Oh yeah, you know, I want the Pope to succeed. Uh, it's very interesting. But yeah. Truly, okay, so truly, let's... Truly the Roman church. I don't call yeah, it... I... it, it, it <laughs> and anyway, the carriage makes its way along the road. You see the land of Magra through the window, empty and desiccated by ancient magic. Magic! And Izate is but a few hours away along this road. The carriage is stuffy and hot from the sun, even with the thick blinds pulled tight. It is a familiar heat, but you will now need to get used to it again. The heat weighs heavily on you, but it also reminds you of your childhood. You will see your family again soon. How will they react to you? Will they accept you after you betrayed their hopes and their trust? You are back in your native province. You will be home soon, but you are no longer the boy who took this very road to the capital four years ago. But who are you now? A clandestine outlaw? A rebel or an agent of the secret chancellery? What future awaits you now? Can you get your freedom back? Can you save everything you hold dear? To drive away the worries about your new life and new destiny, you reread Sophia's letter yet again. Oh, she's got a dumb haircut. I'm glad you didn't do something. I'm glad you didn't do anything stupid and chose to seize your chance for freedom, Bronte. I'll go to Anizate a week after you. Both of us coming back at the same time might attract unwanted attention. It's best if nobody even knows we have anything to do with each other. We'll find an excuse for our frequent meetings later. You should go home and reconnect with your family. Don't draw any attention. Keep your head down. Don't leave that old house of yours. When the time comes, I'll find you. Tell everyone you're planning to open a print shop. Find a building to rent for it, someplace far from prying eyes. It'll be our underground headquarters. I'll tell you more about our mission when we meet. That's all. You put the letter back in your pocket. The walls of Enizate have finally emerged on the horizon. Before you do anything else, you're going home. I'm coming home. Oh, yeah. coming. So these are all of our um, these are all of our options. This is all the stuff we could do for the um, um you know for during this 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 period. Yeah, lots of crazy shit. This is the biggest chapter. Um, so no, I think I think the revolt is all is bigger. But anyway. So it's pretty crazy one. This this you become the you become the secret spy for the empire. Um you incite a rebellion. Yeah, but let's let's not spoil anything. So Yeah, well th this is this is just all the stuff that can happen, all the possible endings. We're not going to get too much into this, but Go ahead. These are things that can happen to your family um, because we're doing because um, we're doing frickin' what is it because we're doing lotless. It is very unlikely this will happen. <laughs> Extremely unlikely. Um, and these are all various. Let's, let's various. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. I'm just saying these are very just just going over this various things that can happen. You know, just to have them keep 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 them in our mind. You know. Just keep keep them in our mind. Um, Go through a lot of events. I'm sure of it. So. Yes. Getting. The carriage stops. The familiar gate. Your bedroom window. The same one you used to climb out of at night from time to time. The well-tended garden with its imported soil, delightful greenery, and mother's beloved violet irises. The porch you used to jump off of when you were little. You are home. You touch the handle of the front door and halt for a moment. 
It has been four years since you left for Eterna, but it feels like yesterday. The air inside is cool, as usual. Father cannot stand a stuffy room and insists on constantly airing out the house. Inside the house, the first thing you hear is the sound of someone running out of the library. Your sister Gloria appears and immediately throws her arms around you. Her joy is so strong you barely manage to stay on your feet. Gloria is dressed in men's clothing, cringe, including collots, a frock coat, and a necktie with a massive pin. She is almost unrecognizable in her new attire. There are dark circles under her eyes, as through as through from lack as though from lack of sleep or frequent tears. Brother, I've been waiting for you for so long. I'm proud to see you've chosen your own path and decided to live the way you want. You're actually going to open your own print shop? You're going to print books? Even poetry? Speaking of poetry... We're opening up a substack. So true, yeah. Yeah, John Milton starting a sub. So that, that's the thing about substack, right? Like, that's what, like, 17th century pamphlets were. They were just, like, guys writing substacks. They were they were they were substacks, and then like people would read their substacks to towns, and then they'd write counter substacks. You know that's what it is. Um, Each other over those substacks. It's, it's true. It's true. <laughs> they duel and they incite rebellions and riots and all kinds of fun stuff. Substack will be studied as one of the most important socio political phenomena of the early twenty first century. Um, early. This is already like the middle. No, the early middle. 20, Middle Dun no, 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 Bobby. All right, no? early, middle, and end is is a divided time period of thirty three years. All right, early twentieth century, two thousand to twenty thirty three. Mid twentieth century, twenty thirty three to twenty sixty six. Late twentieth century, yeah. twenty sixty six to twenty nine. Are you telling me that the two thousand to two thousand and ten? Is the same period as 2010 to 2023. Yes. No, it's not. No. Yes, I, it is. As a Russian, I strongly disagree with Chad, that assessment. Yes. Chad, yes, meme. Unfortunately, you've been, you've been, you've been. <laughs> what are you talking about? Been well, what Chad, the hell? Yes. Like 2000 to 2010 was an era of technological prosperity, of innocent. Uh, theology Innocent. and sub fanaticism, where like the all of the difficult things in life got pushed away in favor of uh, the PDA and the you know the the mobile phone and the personal computer. Like you you can't say that 2000 and the 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 Yogg's cast. Uh, that began 2010, uh, and the the irony of the kind of post 2000 world and the uh, the loss of innocence of politics of culture of society, uh, like hasn't brought it into the new millennia basically into the into the middle of it because I I think that this we are right now in the middle this is going to last till like the late we are in full stagnation loss of innocence loss of any sort of uh kind of psychic barriers like at this point like the only way is through instead of the the only way is up to the you know to the yeah you know Bobby I appreciate that effort post um, I'm going to respond to it by saying they're still the same period. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. Homecoming. Speaking of poetry, from the inner pocket of your jacket, you produce a small book bound in soft black leather. Gloria gingerly accepts your gift. She notices the author's name, Char Miliandis, on the cover and knits her brow. But after quickly flipping through the pages, she showers you with gratitude. I thought Miliandis was just a work... Milianidas, stupid fucking Milanidas. I thought Milanidas was just a warlock. I had no idea he wrote poetry. How fascinating. I'm going to read it all from cover to cover. Mother comes out of the sitting room, leaning on Nathan's arm. You immediately see signs of the illness mentioned in, your, in the letters from home. Her back is bent. Her hair is gray. A thin web of wrinkles covers her face, and her complexion has lost its color. She slowly embraces you. Her arms feel nearly weightless. You press your face into her shoulder, breathing in the nearly forgotten, dearly beloved smell. Mother holds you by the shoulders and studies you for a long time. You've been away so long, son. It's such a shame your journey was in vain. You didn't become a judge or even a priest. I guess it's your fate to bear your lot until the very end. But you'll endure it. That's how I raised you. 
Nathan approaches you after mother. Your younger brother is the same height as you now. His hair almost reaches his shoulders, but he still has the same lost look in his eye when he, ha he had when he was a boy. It's good to see you, brother. Home just hasn't been the same without you. Who care, who care about your estate, right? I'm just glad you're here with us again. You pat Nathan on the back. Loud footsteps echo down the stairs. Stefan appears. His shoulders have grown broader, his, and his features have become harsher, just like grandfather's. He stares you and Nathan down with contempt, his arms crossed on his chest. Welcome back, commoner. I'd hope you'd become my equal, but apparently you just didn't have it in you. I guess you're no better than Nathan. I can only hope you'll know your place from now on. Why did father even send you to the capital in the first place? As Stefan says these words, you see father appear from his study. He looks older now. His back is hunched, and he squints. There are deep lines around his mouth and silver threads in his dark hair and mustache. He stops a few steps away and examines you head to toe. He does not say, his wor say a word, shaking his head slowly. You explain yourself to father. This was the only path you could have taken. The college and the judge's calling were not for you. However, your time in the capital was not spent in vain. You made many influential friends there. And now you plan on op to open a print shop in Anizate and make a good living. You do your very best to make this sound convincing. No one can ever see through your cover story. When I sent my son to the capital, I expected him to return a nobleman. But, but the man who stands before me is a commoner, a merchant, an artisan. I had such high hopes for you, but our family's future rests in Stefan's hands now. Oh well, I've had enough time to make my peace with this. You're still a member of this family. We'll see how your shop fares. Perhaps you can still find a way to contribute to the Bronte household. He lets out a bitter chuckle. Then, after a pause, Father spreads his arm wide to embrace you. You're finally home, my son. Well then, time for dinner. Your mother has prepared a veritable feast in your honor. For the first time in years, your entire family shares a meal at the same table. What would Milton do? Oh shit, time for some harsh decisions. I mean, we like everyone. Mm -hmm. This one's tough, because we got sister, we got the mother, we got the Stefan, and yeah, Gloria. Well, was, was was Milton a mama's boy, or uh, would he would he chat with his brother? If Milton were a CIA operative, who would he chat with? Hmm. Um, his his mother. Uh, his mother from what? Well, that's that's the I left. Mean, that's the left-handed thing, you know. The left-hand path is one who had uh, who had more influence of their. Well, actually, no. This is a uh, John Carter in the chat says, "Ask Gloria why she's a transvestite." She's not. She's just a just a tomboy. Uh, any this? Oh, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a big thing. Paul, get ready for this. Any discussion of form inevitably leads to how to catch a predator. Any discussion of what? A form. Like new menial form. Like the, the the AA saga about tomboys. Like, because, and, and this is a big one, because at one point you arrive to the form of the victim. Uh, what is the form of a victim? A woman? Um, yeah. Well, well... Very good, very good. Bravo, Paul. You, you just divined everything. No, it's 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 deeper than that. But it's like it's it's a fucked up conversation that we're not going to have today, but we might have some today. It's very very uh, un-American in a way. Uh, something that like you know. But but A was kind of he, he didn't see or he hadn't seen the dangers that lie in the. Uh, kind of uh, in the tomboy discussion and the, like the muscle woman stuff. It's very where, unfortunate where he, for AA. Yeah, where, where, where he invoked uh, Evola's uh, discussion of form. And of course, uh, the, there are like things that come out of it, like evil goblins spring out of that black hole of, this, of the one of the oldest discussions in philosophy, which is like, what is the form of the, the object, like of, of, the, of the world? I guess when you refer to an object, uh, yeah. So anyway, so in this case, let's go left hand path, mother. Paul. Yep, just clicked Wait. it. You cautiously asked mother about her health over dinner. 
Oh, it's nothing, Paul. I have no complaints. I've just been a little weak lately. It happens at my age. I humbly accept whatever fate the twins have chosen for me. Having said this, she stops abruptly and looks upward. Father cuts in. You know, son, you should tell us about your life in the capital. What gave you the idea to open a print shop? You mentioned in one of your letters that you've seen the Imperial family with your own eyes. What are the Tempests like? You have to relate the four years you spent in Eterna, carefully omitting anything that might reveal your secret mission. Only later that night, while talking to Nathan on the back porch, do you learn more about Mother's health. I'll be frank with you, Mother isn't doing so well. Gloria and I do our best not to leave her alone. You can ask her questions, but her answers often don't make sense and she keeps falling silent in the middle of conversation like she did today. Her illness is consuming her. You know, if mother passes, she may not be reborn. I dread to think what will, ha what will become of father then, and of Gloria. Gloria has had it hard too lately. Stefan has treated her like dirt for the last year. I think he plans to drive her out of the house so her origins won't taint the Bronte reputation anymore. Stefan only cares about one thing now, getting our family ennobled by the sword. So for him, Gloria is just an obstacle between him and his goal. You spend quite some time in silence, gazing at the radiant stripe of the shining pillar as it grows more and more luminous against the darkening sky. The Bronte family is about to face some challenging times. But Mom loves us, so that's okay. Mm. I will say this, Bobby. Um... You know, someone once told me that, you know, whenever whenever the mother dies, the family dies with her. Um, and, you know, that's just true. Like, mm. like mm. I, 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 maybe it's... So I grew up in a really, really matri... Oh, real quick, actually, Bobby, before I get on this tangent, I'm going to go fill up my coffee cup again. Then I'll come back. And okay, I'll, wonderful. And I'll, yeah. and I'm going gonna, gonna to go... I'm gonna sing Russian songs to the one guy. That's sing it, sing it to the audience. You know, talk about how talk about how um uh, how the Wagner PMC was just like <laughs> yeah, know, the, the orcs. So 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 real quick uh, before before we do leave, um, one of the funny things we noticed about the Skildings U.S. event, right, is that whenever the Skildings event happens, like massive wars just tend to happen in the Slavic world. Like last year. Pretty much, you know, the, the Skildings event was almost immediately timed at about the same time that Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, and then um, uh, and then this year, when the Skildings event happened, Wagner PMC decided to march on Moscow. And then Moscow just told them, go home, and then they did. <laughs> so that was kind of a nothing-ever-happens event. Um, but yeah, I'll be back. <laughs> Теплое место на улице ждут отпечатков наших нот. Звездная пыль на сапогах. Мягкое кресло клетчатый плед не нажатый во время курорта. Солнечный день в ослепительных снах группа крови. На рукаве мой порядковый номер, на рукаве. Пожелай мне удачи в бою, пожелай мне остаться в этой траве, не остаться в этой траве. Пожелай мне удачи, пожелай мне удачи тут. All right, I am back. <laughs> I no, can't. I don't. I don't, pre I don't prefer any Vareniki, John. I can't, uh, I can't, I can't sing any, uh, I can't sing any, sl any, uh, Russian songs, but I can sure sing a lot of, um, uh, I can sure sing a lot of, uh, South Slav songs about how they're going to get the Bosniaks this time. Um, <laughs> well, well, look, when, when we go on our St. Petersburg trip, that's what we're going to listen to early 2000s, uh, Russians. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know any of that. Yeah, no, it's it's just it's just it's just like like 
Negro South Slavs basically singing how the other South Slavs are oh, Negroes man. and that they're God's chosen people or some something like that. Oh, cr- cr- like, like, it's just like, it's like, it's like the, what is it? It's like, um, y- you ever notice this phenomenon, Bobby, that happens whenever like a big empire comes into an area and they make like one ethnicity, their sort of attack dog ethnicity, um, you know, and and then they leave, and the ethnicity kind of clings onto the empire because that was the only thing that you know really made them different. And so, like that, it's like for example, like the um, um the Ulstermen in Northern Ireland are more British than the British. You know, they're they 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 care about the British mm-hmm. Empire. They'll fight for it more than the British actually will. Um, and that's because they were the sort of auxiliary ethnicity, and so it's like. The problem with this, with the with the South Slavs, and I was talking to a Serb at the Skildings event. He was a a, a, a Canadian via Serbia, um, you know, and so, so he was he he left Serbia, came to Canada, so he was a Serb in in Canada, and I talked to him about you know the Balkans and the South Slavs, and he's basically, you know, the way he explained it to me was basically like you had three different empires come in and carve up the Balkans in three different ways. You know, you had the Catholic Habsburgs, you had the Orthodox Russians, and the... Uh, well, that was, like, Sildings Slav? The, the, well, it wasn't a speech, but it was just a dude who was at Skildings that I was talking to about this. Oh, were um, there any Russians at Sildings, or no. just this one Slav? No, oh. no, and and the, this this guy was, like, a Canadian citizen. He was just ethnically a Serb. Um, uh, oh, my God. <laughs> but I'm... Um, Serbs. <laughs> No, and he looked the part too. He was actually a really cool dude. But you know, I was talking to him yeah. about it, and he basically said, you know, it's like you know, then you know, and once the three empires left, they're de- like basically the artificial lines they drew or whatever, uh, kind of stuck. And so once they left, all these three Slavic peoples kind of had to define themselves. They were forced to define themselves, you know, with the death of Tito, as mm. like a, a and they had nothing really to draw on because they're you know they're basically freaking stone age tribes before these empires rolled in um you know they had nothing yeah, to you, def- go ahead well when when wagner was invading or whatever like my dad spent the entire day and night like entire 24 hours just sitting there and like rooting for his football team uh or, or whatever like it was it was cringe uh and i told him almost immediately that they're gonna reach a conclusion that like whatever you say like yeah Wagner is awesome and you know me as an orc i feel very represented you know it's good media representation i feel like a black little black uh girl you know sitting in the cinema watching you know the new mermaid uh but i, I told them that like they're gonna reach a, an agreement, and like nothing's gonna happen. Everyone's gonna go home. And wow, I was right. Uh, you know, thank you, Mr. Joe, and uh, <laughs> Prudentialist. The nothing ever happens gangs wins again. Stacking W's, buddy. Oh, anyway. Well, anyway, let's go. First steps. After several days of searching and inquiring, you find a suitable location for the print shop. You chose. You choose a two-story building on a dead-end street, away from any pedestrian thoroughfares, right next to the city's outer wall, spacious and sturdy. It has more than enough space for the printing press and workbenches. The basement is dry, and the windows are too tiny to peek through. It is the perfect location for a clandestine headquarters. You inspect the rooms. This corner will be good for the typesetting area. Then the shelves of ink can go over there. Before you finish, Sophia knocks at the door. Once inside, she casts a glance over the room and walls and chuckles with approval. This is just what we need, Bronte. A perfect location. I couldn't have found anything better myself. Guess the capital taught you well. I'm glad to see I was right about you. This job will be a lot easier with your help. Sophia brushes a layer... I hate her haircut. Sophia brushes a layer (laughs) of dust from an old wooden crate and then lights her pipe as she says... Maybe maybe they made that on purpose. Maybe, like, the Russian dev's like, oh, you want to do the feminism route? Look at your ugly woman. This is what you're fighting for. Absolutely. Look at your ugly polycule creature. And then, then meanwhile, they've got the noble path, which is the one I most often play. Or, well, I have played the most often because I try to get two different endings with it. Um... And, you know, your your love interest in that is like this, you know, Arwen-type, you know, beautiful princess that just looks amazing. And then, and then the lotless path is, like, basically 
Polak peasant freaking strong featured 1920 you're, flapper. You're marrying Alina Dunham. It's true. It's true. So, how about I tell you what you and I are up to in this town, eh? Remember what we did in the capital? Well, we're going to do the same trick here in Enizate. That's our mission. Felipe wants us to form an underground society here. Any, anybody who wants to rebel and riot will let them join. We'll also keep them in check and use them to do whatever the secret chancellor says. I still don't know everything Felipe's planning yet, but I can tell you he was real angry about, the Inquisi about how the Inquisition cast all the dirt we dug up on Patriarch Junius to the Four Winds. Here in Anizate, Felipe wants the real deal. You frown. The real deal? What's that supposed to mean? It means you and I have to find all the troublemakers in town and take charge of them. Anybody who's willing to fight for their rights, we turn them into an organized force under our command, and then we'll use them to do whatever Felipe wants. Felipe wants to take the city in his own hands. He needs disorder. Little disturbances and riots, enough unrest so there's always an excuse to arrest folks whenever they need to. But Felipe always has to be in control. This is the secret chancellor's way. As long as the streets are restless, everybody, especially the overseer, will keep thinking good old Sir Felipe Alfaro is a real useful friend to have. Savior of the empire and all that. Their last bulwark against the rabble rouser. So real quick, Bobby, I want to I comment on like what's going on here. All right. So whether Sophia's playing along for, you know, ideological reasons or not, Bobby, this is how the national security state works, okay? This is how the American CIA, FBI, all of the NSA, all of the intelligence agencies, all of the, you know, the, especially the Department of Homeland Security, you know, which is just unconstitutional. Yeah, which, which, is, which is right now ferrying thousands of migrants into America. It's true, and they're they're getting they're they're resettling them in just the middle of the freaking country. That I, I I wonder if this yeah. will have unforeseen consequences. Um, yeah. But well, well, this is uh, you. What is, what is it? Shit. Okay, can continue, continue. Yeah. So 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 this is this is what they do, right? You know, they have their own little people, you know, and they they appoint them to. They appoint them to be like, you know, what is it like, like, you know, you'd say double agents, but really they're just kind of like given free reign to do what they did normally. It's just they're on the leash of the of the CIA. And so they create their own terror threat. They train people. They release people to be their own terror threat, to be their own terrorists, to sort of foment. To They basically they cause the disruption to be fomented. They then like you know the cia then comes in and like takes all these people out and then they start it over again this is what's called the self-licking ice cream cone or the tail wagging the dog right um i love it the self-licking ice cream cone. That, that, that's was what it, it was it curtis yarvin who... he didn't invent it but he wrote the most famous essay on it um and yeah that's that's you know these are the people i grew up around you know like this Ooh. is how the intelligence establishment works you know they invent someone once made the comment that Countries without a anti-terrorism force have no terrorism. And, you know, that seems strange to me, but then I, like, looked into it, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's kind of true, because, you know, all the terrorists are... It's, it's like, you know, if you're the only... Bobby, if you're the only dog catcher in town, why would you catch all the dogs that were loose? Because suddenly you'd be out of a job. Oh, well, you can also invent dogs. You can tell people that there are dogs and then catch invisible dogs or you can you say that or you can let people's dogs out or you can you can qualify you can categorize people's dogs as wild dogs and then catch them it's true it's true and that that's the thing you know it's it's like it's like it's the conflict of interest it's like well you know why do these people have basically unchecked power and influence and you know, people talk about how the FBI, CIA is basically the Praetorian Guard of the United States. They're the kind of secret shadow masters behind the scenes. And there have been some takes recently that I actually really like as to how the CIA and the FBI aren't really the American intelligence community. They're, they're actually extensions of the British intelligence committee uh, community. And that they're kind of like one of the ways that the British Empire secretly keeps influence in the United States and, you know, has, you know, the, uh, several institutions of the United States captured vis-a-vis uh, -vis institutions like the State Department, like CIA, like, um, uh, you know, all these other things. And this is the take, the real schizo take that, you know, 
at least seemingly, until you actually look at the facts, for example, one of them being that the British crown is the largest landowner in the world, you know, which is, mm. which is a fact. That's not like me making that up. That's just real. And the fact that... I think, I think like the Vatican, the Catholic Church also owns a lot of land. They're up there, but they're not number one. Um, number one is the British crown. Um, mm. Through all of its various constituent holdings. But it, the buck stops at the British crown. Um, and then uh, number two, uh, another example would be... Uh, was it... Um, no train of thought don't go don't go don't go no stay 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 train of thought um you know the the, the foggy bottom langley captured institutions uh british crown of yeah yeah yeah. yeah. so this is the, this is the real schizo take um that a lot of people don't understand but it's like it's like um the british empire just never fell they just decided to um uh they just they it retreated a retreat little bit. It retreated yeah. a little bit, but the thing is, is it's and, and it stopped calling itself that, and it stopped putting the British flag on all of its subjects. But it one hundred percent still exists. What do you think the Commonwealth countries are? Why do you think there was a notion floated for the United States to join the Commonwealth countries? You know, it's like it's like, um, and th and that's the thing. It's like it's it's it really it never. People talk about the managerial class, the managerial elite. You know who that managerial elite is? You know who it, you know where it comes from? It's all just the British Empire bureaucracy. That's all it is. You know, it's it's and I, I need to emphasize the British because that's still, you know, the I, I remember what I was gonna say, it's still the world financial center. You know, up until twenty eighteen, the United States fiscal policy was basically decided by LIBOR. Um or twenty twenty, I don't know when it, it was it was stopped, but LIBOR was a conference of eighteen banks met in the city of London, and only one of them was an American bank, and that was the J.P. Morgan branch um, in, uh, in London. Um, that was in, but otherwise, like, that's where all of the interest rates that's the, that the Fed would then set were decided and, and all that other stuff. So basically, until recently, that was where the United States had its mon monetary policy dictated from. That's a really significant piece of influence. You know, take, for example, the five eyes, right? why is the five eyes a thing well british empire you know um and and a anyway i don't mean to i don't mean to get too much into this bobby but this is why like the entire elite of the united states is still obsessed with russia um you know even after the end of the cold war that's a real schizo take. It is a real there, schizo there. take, but you know it's it's. Tr but it's very cool. Uh, my dad would appreciate dude, it, dude. It's it's <laughs> like it's like you know why is the American elite obsessed with Russia? Because they're all basically taught the way that the British wants them to learn. You know it's mm. you know all of we still live in the British Empire. Just ceased to call itself that but it's like it still exists you know it's and why do they hate russia why are they trying to you know pull all the stops against russia because mckinder island thesis it's not tr it's not correct it's not true but it's what it's the policy goal of the of the british foreign policy which the americans have kind of been forcibly cottoned on to um you know this weird. is why I, it's it's why weird. it's a, weird how how, like there's this kind of strange because mm, i really don't see what like russians are like doing to the world or something like that like russian citizens when they come to another country they do not get surveilled by like russian government or they don't get special um special like clauses that they need to do in that country to like to push certain agendas or to vote a certain way uh in fact that's like one of the big complaints of well, for example my dad is that the russian government does not support russians abroad that they don't like organize with them they don't have like these uh, like like china does or like india does or like you know like like afghanistan or whatever like with, with muslims isis or whatever russians just come into a country learn the language uh, and then very frequently adopt the identity of the country in which they are in which they live right they don't cause like pogroms they don't cause uh, like financial instability uh, and i mean they don't even like ghettoize there's one exception which is the brighton beach but all russians from like everywhere all expats 
Lefty Bryden Beach as the black sheep of the family. They're like, what the fuck are they doing? What the fuck is that language that they've invented? Uh, like, this is stupid. Why are there newspapers in Russian? And, um, uh, like, and I just, I don't see where this rabid hate of Russia as a country comes from. Well, it, like, so and I'll tell you exactly yeah. where it comes from. It's not a natural thing. Americans, you know, Americans actually, the, Amer the U.S. government and the Russian government were allies. You know, like you take it during the yeah. Civil War. This man fights, uh, this man is your friend, he fights for your freedom. Well, yeah, and I mean, yeah, and that's, and you know, but that's because, you know, that was before basically yeah. the American WASP elite kind of decided because, you know, the key is the WASPs, right? The WASPs decided that they were going to, in order to become British, they wanted to become British. They wanted, they really wanted it. And there was a massive European wealth transfer to the United States. But the thing is that all those wealthy European families kept their ties to Europe. They brought the wealth here. There was a massive X, X, was it? There was a massive emigration of wealth, but they kept their ties to Europe. Um, and this is where people talk about the sort of transatlantic elite, you know, the, the sort of Anglo-American intermarrying of top families that kind of, you know, caught in the United States back onto the United Kingdom and British foreign policy, um, you know, which was exempt, which was sort of the masterstroke of which was entering on the side of the, um, uh, entering on the side of the Entente World War One, which we really had no business doing. Um, and it wasn't really in favor of the interests of the United States. The United States has its own sphere of influence. You want to talk about great powers, Bobby? The United States has no business, like, really confronting Russia at all, except for a very limited sphere in the North Pacific, you know? And... Yeah, yeah I, I get it. There's, like, this... Um... There's oil there, and I think like other natural resources. Yeah, and like... because because it's the ocean, and it's the sea, and it's ice. It's difficult to place borders because you know at the poles, uh, kind of reality breaks down a little bit. Like well, it's yeah. um, entrepreneurs. Well, no, that's that's correct, and so that's that's the only like real natural place of contention, and it's the least populated place in Russia. You know, mm -hmm. the, 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 mm -hmm. you know, Vlad, it's Vladivostok and nothing else. Um, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 like, so that's, that's where the United States, like, that's the only place the United States has any sort of, and, and the thing is, is like, there's a huge buffer. We, the United States has no reason to be opposed to Russia. Like, we're just like, like you just look at it geographically. We're two entirely separate spheres of influence, you know? Maybe, maybe but it would. I, maybe. I think culturally, you're very, you're, you're kind of close. A lot of Russians really appreciate America for what it is, or like, like American honesty is very appreciated in Russia. Wait, and it's very, uh, it's, it's the polar opposite of the fucking British. It's the polar opposite of the English. Perfidious Albion really <laughs> is a thing. You know, the, the, what, what's, what's the joke, Bobby? Why did the sun never set on the British Empire? Because God didn't want these fucking people running around in the dark, like, <laughs> like you know, that, and that that's the thing. You know, you ever heard the saying, Bobby? You know, trust, trust an Italian before a Jew, trust a Jew before a Greek, trust a Greek before a Romanian, but never trust an Englishman. <laughs> it's I've, I've had some bad encounters with Englishmen on the internet, like. I've had it um, once. I tried to invite people. You know, do you know Revolut? I do not. Uh, it's a fintech company, and they have this deal that, like, if you sign up to it, uh, and like it's all free, you just order your card, you get like sixty euros, and the person that invited you gets sixty euros as well, and whatever. Uh, and like the more honest I became, the worse the response for like English people <laughs> started because they the more honest I was like, well, yeah, you know, this is a fintech company and whatever, and it's like, uh, you know, as with any bank, uh, you know, it's like risky, but you're not going to be storing like millions there. And the more I talked, <laughs> the the more they thought I was a scammer, you know. Oh, man, the worst, the worst, most midwit. Uh, in, in, in my life uh, yeah, but 
and, and then it became a meme on the server so well yeah. i'll tell you what i am not going to uh I'm not going to continue with the schizo, the British Empire is actually the Dude. real enemy take. But, like, the schizo is actually the real British Empire. Like, you know, <laughs> you know, it's it's like, it's like, who, what culture did the Rothschilds assimilate themselves into? Oh, shit. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I get yeah. it. You know, I, I you get know. it. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, so, anyway. But, um, uh. All I'm saying Let's is that see. the spirit of 1776 must rise from the soil. America must fight its second war of independence. Um, anyway, but Sophia oh, says... Oh, look, look, at this, look at this Sophia picture. Isn't it cool? Like, she has the lantern in one hand, and then a dagger in the other, a money... A, like, a pouch on her hip, a weird belt that looks like a like a clock piece because you can see she's not wearing any watches and then she's got an earring in one of her ears and then it's 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 artfully done but her haircut's dumb yeah her ha haircut's weird it's like it's like a um it's like a whirlpool if you look at it it's, it's like, like it's like this it's this androgynous thing you know definitely definitely very androgynous very uh, but still, like they drew this for a reason. It is like the the illumination, but really just a dark dagger in your back. Oh, very cool. So let's go ahead. As long as the streets are restless, oh yeah, we've, we've already we've already read this. This was this is what prompted yeah. the whole discussion. The, the more floor. the more riots and unrest we incite, the stronger our underground force will become, and the stronger the secret chancellor will get. Once the people are shouting in the squares, the prefecture and the magistrate will be powerless, and our buddy Fleep, Fleep, will pick up the slack. Fleep. You following so far? You nod. So you are supposed to incite and rest. Is that all you have to do? That's just the beginning. Felipe also wants the lesser quorum broken up at some point in the future. It's full of folks who don't like the way things are done in the Empire. But the Empire is lucky for now. The lesser quorum spends too much time bickering and not enough time trying to work together. That'll work in our favor. So by the time Felipe wants to blackmail the lesser quorum, we'll have to have our own underground network, and it's got to be big enough for his needs. We'll frame quorum members, gather accusations, plant agents, stuff like that. In other words, we'll do the secret chancellor's dirty work for him. Now, let's get down to business. Here in Anizate, there are some big shots who are opposing the Imperial Order. We need to do our best to exploit them for our cause. If we're lucky enough, maybe we can even get them on our side. Sophia starts counting on her fingers. Number one on my list is Augustin El Borne, Prefect of Magra. He's almost a relative to you, isn't he? When Gaius Tempest was first appointed overseer of Magra, he was the only member of the provincial council who openly supported him. El Borne is one of the most powerful nobles in Magra, but he has always protected the common folk. He could be our main ally, or a real dangerous enemy. The second fellow worth mentioning is Mayor Egmont. Le Mayor, with an E, leader of the wealthy commoners in the Lesser Quorum. He's an old merchant who got rich mining silver and managed to weasel his way into provincial politics as a commoner. We need to ensure Egmont's support as soon as possible. He's rich, powerful, and will be useful to our cause. Last on my list is Father Leonard. He's the abbot of the temple by the silver tree and the local spiritual leader of the new believers. Right now, lots of Magadan commoners are rejecting Isatius' teaching of the lots, and it's all thanks to Leonard and his influence. If those folks have managed to cast off one burden, it should be easy to talk them into rejecting another one. Sophia taps her pipe against the crate, knocking the remaining tobacco onto the floor. One more thing, Bronte. We're going to be manipulating people. I'm talking lies, half-truths, using and exploiting folks, you name it. And we need to get them to follow us. That's a tough thing to do. People can smell phonies a mile away, so we have to believe everything we say. I mean, really believe it, from the bottom of our hearts. If you aren't ready to die for your cause, why expect it from other folks? But you also have to remember who we're really doing all this for. She trails off. You wait a moment, and then ask Sophia why she has agreed to do this. Why she is working for Felipe. Can't she run from him or use her magic to subdue him? Sophia's deep eyes focus all their attention on you. The merciless Magnan sun fills the room through the narrow window, reflected in her eyes as a multitude of yellow sparks. You think I never tried it, Bronte? Don't be naive. Magic will not help me bring Felipe, Felipe down. When I use my power, you notice it quickly, and Felipe notices it even faster. If I try to enchant him ever again, I'll be collared and sent back to the House of Humility. I'm never going back there again. Not ever. As for escaping, there's no hiding from the secret chancellery. Sooner or later, they will find me. The Empire is absolute. The Empire is eternal. The Empire is everywhere. We're all in the same cage. There's no way out of it. And so it will be as long as the Empire still stands. 
so forget about running away. If you want to get out of this alive, just do what I tell you. Trust me and I'll take care of you. Now let's talk about your next step. We need to shore up our cover story. Make sure it doesn't fall apart the first time gendarmes take a close look at it. Get this print shop to work. You need employees. You're good at picking the right people, just as good as me, so you'll do the hiring. Choose people who are loyal, people who do the job and keep their mouths shut. Man, she fucking talks. When Felipe gets here, we'll have to show him what we've accomplished so far. And you don't want to disappoint him, so you'd better get cracking. We've got a lot of work to do. With that, so she's a she's a woman, Judge Jackson. <laughs> With that, Sophia nods to you and leaves. You are left alone to pace the rooms of your future print shop and think, what will you do first? What would Milton do? You know what he would do. Is this this just one possible, one possible uh, option, which is of course could be to the printing business. It's so true. It's so true. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Milton, like, look, guys. This is just this is just an excuse for us to get Milton to um uh, to you know build a successful printing business. And the under part cover part of your job can wait. You have to get the print shop up and running first. You will not be satisfied by a mere semblance of a business. No, you are going to found a successful shop capable of turning a profit. You convince you convince father to contribute a portion of the family's funds to the venture and purchase a printing press, movable type, quality paper, and expensive ink. Then you hire skilled labor. The best printers you can find in Anizate. Wait, they will... What's movable type? Um, it's so before computers, I could be totally wrong because I'm not a print. I'm not a printer. However, I would assume it's you know you were able to um, um you know how when you printed a printing press you would arrange the letters in such a way. Mm -hmm. So I think what movable type was was it was a um um it was a means of arranging the letters faster so that you mm -hmm. could um um I don't know I don't know how it would work but it was like. I don't know if it was like dials that you would cover in ink or if it was like a, um, uh, like, you know, putting pieces of a puzzle together. Yeah, maybe instead of covering it in ink, it would have like an automatic covering in ink. So you just load in the words or the, the letters and uh, then it would like print it automatically. So you wouldn't need to like to do the whole coloring and, and all that stuff. You would just load it in, load in the plate. And then it would just print, 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 you know, like 20 copies or 500 copies. And then you'd load in another plate, something like that. Yeah, I think that's exactly it. Um, hold sure. on. Give me one second. Man, printing was a whole art form. And then, bam, it's gone. Just in a span of like, what, like? Five years, ten years, just poof. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and and this is I think this is what Milton would have done because he would have you know invested set up his own freaking print shop because Milton Milton doesn't care about this secret spy stuff. He just he just wants to write Substacks. <laughs> exactly. Okay. All right, I'm back. Um, they will teach the future resistance members whom you will hire later. <clears throat> it is such a pleasure to watch the print shop come to life. You may have begun this undertaking for an entirely different cause, but now you have turned the print shop into something that is yours. The first thing you print is a thick stack of advertising sheets. Soon these black and red leaflets appear on every street of Anizate. Bronte's print shop is open for business. <laughs> Very interesting. Profitable business. Thanks to your investment, it becomes much more believable as a front than it may actually it may actually turn a profit sooner or later. Exactly. Yeah, it's good. Good. We we get a first first make sure that the printing is operational. And then we can like lie to people. Well Bobby, we're also I think we're gonna we're gonna keep going for another there's a reason I think we're going for, you know, not, not there's a reason, but I'm uh, there's, um, uh, was it, we're going for another 45 minutes. I think, um, we're going to probably Absolutely. finish it at, you know, get, keep it around the two hour mark. I like the two hour mark, Bobby. Yeah, it's uh, good. It's good. I, I agree. It's like, you go much time. beyond that. You start getting exhausted. Let's um, see if we can get Joe for the next one. That could be cool. Who's, who's Joe? Mm. Joe, the guy who does, uh, with, uh, with Prudentialist. Geo? Uh, 
Geo, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you want to bring, if you want to just yeah. DM Geo, like you DM yeah. Cringe Walker, just be like, yes, you'll need to come on show with me and Paul. That's how Cringe Walker, you know. So Cringe Walker was at the Skildings event. He was actually uh, he, I we rode down together. Um, we were in the same carpool, and so it was me and Cringe Walker and other people talking for about fifteen hours, which was what fun. What did he look like? Cringe Walker looked like. Um, you know, to avoid, to avoid doxable information, he looked like he was from New York. Um, <laughs> that's the only thing I can say. Um, but yeah, no, we were talking about this stuff and, um, but yeah, I mean, if you want to DM Geo and bring him on, sure. Why not? Yeah, let's try it. Let's, I'll, I'll try. I'll see if I can DM him on Twitter. Like, yeah. But a reception. Cause, cause he, he, he dresses like a Russian pop, uh, like a Russian priest, you know, the Orthodox one. You come back home after a short stroll through the city. As soon as you set foot in the house, you are greeted by Stefan, who invites you to have a talk in Father's office. When you enter the room, Father has a heap of letters in front of them and is signing them one after another. Son, Stefan and I must discuss an important matter with you. While you were in the ca capital, our family formally petitioned the overseer to grant us nobility of the sword. We have three generations of noble blood already. We have the right to make our nobility hereditary. Your grandfather took the first steps towards nobility of the sword as soon as Stefan was born. And now we are on the brink of becoming the Elbrantes. If Overseer Gaius Tempest and the nobles of the province deem us worthy, we will receive a hereditary title. All nobles of the Bronte family will remain noble forever, as will their descendants. Father and I do our utmost to maintain the family's position, but our goal can be reached only if the, our reputation remains unblemished in the eyes of high society. The nobility is watching our every step. Father lays a hand on your shoulder. Now this is your cause, too. The future of our family depends on it. We need an estimable reputation and wealth. Everyone bearing the name of Bronte affects it. Remember that with every action you take, Paul. You will have to appear before Anizate High Society. We're going to host a reception for the nobility at our home soon. You must uphold the honor of our family, brother. You'll relate the news from Eterna to our guests and present yourself in a favorable light. With Stefan at the helm, the entire family spends a week preparing for the majestic reception. The house is flooded with decorations and new tableware. Delicacies are cooking in the kitchen round the clock, and the napkins now bear an embroidered oak branch and chains, the Bronte family crest. Gloria is the only one to neglect the common cause. Were it up to me, I wouldn't be seen at this hypocritical gathering, but I don't want to let Sir Robert down. He's the only reason I plan to stay for the event. <laughs> the evening of the reception has come. Dignified conversations and the clinking of glasses fill the house. Among your guests are many highborn, powerful people. Your father and Stefan dance from guest to guest, making sure no one is overlooked. Young Paul, how splendid to see you. So what was your time in the capital like? You exchange, you exchange pleasantries with a high-placed relative. Meanwhile, Gloria and mother spend the evening on a, set, on a settee by the wall without drawing any attention. Neither your father nor your elder brother introduce them to the noble guests. Still, one of the guests, a young nobleman of the sword named José El Pelletier, keeps staring at Gloria in fascination. Your sister averts her eyes, bemused. Lady Gloria, you are the true gem of the evening. You look so marvelously daring. I haven't seen your like even in the capital, simp. No, he's just, he's just, as my Italian's colleague said, turning up the riz. It's so true. Yeah, man, man, they, they just, they started using the word riz in Italy. I hate that. I, the, it's, it's cringe. It was cringe. Anyone, it was terrible. Anyone I was, I was in the... I was on the phone with that guy, and he was like, well, hey, you, boy, are Cesar and me are reeds. And I was like, no! 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 <laughs> Fuck. Oh, man. That's awful. That's, it's so bad. Uh, it just appeared out of nowhere. Like, like once again, evil, uh, what is it? Um, uh, evil little hobgoblins hob, hob, uh, goblin hobbling around. Coming so after true. Us. When you walk past Gloria, you hear her hurried whisper. Paul, please talk to me. This Sir El Pelletier keeps following me. I feel uneasy. What does he want from me? I'm just a lowly commoner. Come with me to the other side of the room. Although I'll probably still stand out amongst all these refined nobles. Look, it's Durante the painter. I wonder what's brought him so far from the capital. It would be fabulous if he could paint our family portrait. We should all be on canvas together. We're one big happy family after all. Wine glass... In, in your hand, you cast a look across the crowded room. It is time to choose how you will spend the evening. Okay, sure. Drink evening. yourself to death. Present your mother and sister. Care the news. Oh, man. You know, you know what you would do. Oh, then again, it wasn't... No, it, it wasn't Milton, right? Did, did Milton paint? 
Let's let's Google real quick. Am I like am I am I dumb? Who 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 drew the the Revelations dragon, the the dragon and the lady? Uh, one second. Red dragon. Yeah, exactly. Well, my, my as yeah. an appreciator of of the arts. Although he was also a uh, well, no, only only images of Christ. He didn't like images of Christ. Um, hmm. I was thinking of William Blake. <laughs> hmm. Wait, William Blake and uh, no, when did when did Milton live? Milton lived in the 17th century. Exactly. Yes. Okay. So they never saw each other. Well, we can so we can burn some wealth because um, because we've invested in the print shop and that's going to make us some wealth later. So Milton, as an appreciator of the arts, he would of course purchase a family portrait. But then again, share the news from the capital. That's also like a thing he would. He does like to share the. Yes, but he'd do it on his Substack. Well, he'd do it on his Substack. He wouldn't. He'd write a Substack article. He wouldn't tell people in public. Yeah, it's true, it's true. He's not a, a what do you call it, a street crier? Yeah. The artist is scrutinizing the portrait of your grandfather on the wall of the sitting room. You will always remember grandfather like this. His heavy, searching look, his hawkish features, his imposing body, and the cane he kept in his hands at all times. Oh no, our grandfather was Henry Kissinger! <laughs> so true. So true. Uh, as if by pure chance you passed by Durante and mentioned that the local portrait was painted by a local artist. But surely Sir Durante's skill must be incomparably greater. Would he be interested in painting a group portrait of the entire Bronte family? At first, Durante politely declines. He must head back to the capital soon. He has no time to spare for painting. But you remonstrate that you will pay any price, and this work will be seen by the highest society of any Zate. Durante eventually succumbs to your persuasion. You spend the, ne the night negotiating with the painter. A proper portrait will take a fair amount of time to paint, and Durante's prices are high. Convincing your family turns out to be just as challenging. Gloria will not pose in a dress or put her hair in a bun. Nathan almost has to be forced to cut his hair. Stefan insists that he must be drawn to the right of his father with Gloria behind them. Eventually, you succeed in helping your family reach a consensus. The portrait is perfect. Your parents look dignified, hand in hand. Stefan stands proudly to their right. You and your best attire are to the left of them. Gloria brings some life to the painting with her unruly hair and daring outfit. Even Nathan seems to belong there. The portrait is proudly displayed above the fireplace in the sitting room. No one else in Magda has a portrait by Durante himself. This will emphasize our position. For once, Gloria agrees with her elder brother. At least on this canvas, we're all one family, whatever our estates may be. Oh, we're in poverty. Alas, but we'll make it back. And we've we've gained a a a a pinch, a crumb of reputation. <laughs> but we did get the unity up to peace. Yes, that's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, well, we were we were at peace before, but yeah, the family's doing all right. Bobby, I have a question for you. Yeah. Would you rather your family be well respected and have disagreements internally, or be content internally but be disgraced externally? Content internally, because my family had never been content internally, so I would strive to be what I am not, something like that. Hmm. Uh, because we we were always respected. I mean, that was the one thing that we, we had, is that, you know, we were very respectable children, and our parents were very respectable parents. Uh, as, as children, we were like little, uh, like, like, what do you call them? Like the, like like royals children that yeah. like, don't run around and, like scream and whatnot. We would like, you know, my my dad and my well my mother at the time uh, because they were already separated. But I was in France, and uh, to not be Russian, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's difficult. Nordic people have a difficult relationship with their families, but. Um, you know, when when we used to be in Switzerland, I mean, I was like 11 or 12 and I spoke French fluently. I thought in French. And so I was just dragged around everywhere. And, you know, my, my dad, uh, we went to Bordeaux once, uh, south of France, you know, or, or is it north of France? I don't know. My geography is bad. But basically, it's the wine region. And we would go to all these wine places and wine like uh, gatherings and my dad would take me with him and i would just speak french the whole evening with all those people 
and they were like they were amazed and i would get so many compliments uh, and then i forgot french <laughs> and italian is not a, a royal language it's a clown language which i do like uh it's a much more natural language than something like english uh but it's a very old language too a lot of the things for example uh if, if you cheer for a um, for a team in football uh you are called the ill the tifoso the person that's ill with typhus um, and then there's lots of stuff like that and you kind of get lost in it sometimes but it's a in, in a way it's a more primitive language like that uh but uh, i mean uh, it's it's very homely i guess not not in like the ugly homely but uh, homely is in it feels like home uh, it's very pleasant to the ear, uh, while something like English is highly analytical, highly precise, and very, very work-like. Like, I understand English completely when people talk to me, when I read books, when I write, uh, while Italian is more mysterious. There's a lot of little, like, things that... I can't immediately piece together, and so most of the time I go by vibes. I can, I can, like, understand it, I know all the words, but sometimes, like, the endings, or, like, what does this refer to? Because Italians don't always like personal pronouns. If you can play with a verb and its ending without putting in a personal pronoun, an Italian will do that. Russian is a little bit more um, rigid in that sense, is that personal pronouns are liked, and a lot of the things that you would say without them in Italian, uh, you would say with them in Russian, but you still can do it. You you can, like, not use personal pronouns. It's just kind of awkward. Like, it's grammatically correct, but it's weird. Um, and yeah, and and that's why I will never speak perfect Italian. Uh, because, like, I will just insert personal pronouns in a lot of places in which they really shouldn't be. Yeah. So, yeah. Once again, Bobby, I have no idea how to respond to this information, but thank you for sharing <laughs> it. Um, a rock and a hard place. The Bronte home has been uneasy for several months now. With Father traveling all over the province for his judicial duties, the animosity between Stefan and Gloria has grown into a full-blown feud. Your elder brother tries to use his position as heir to keep his sister in check and make her behave in accordance with her estate. Gloria repudiates his authority. Their fights rock the house on a daily basis. Eventually, after returning from his latest trip, Father gathers Stefan, Gloria, Nathan, and you in his office. His somber look portends a difficult conversation. Stefan gazes at his father defiantly. Gloria is poised to lash out and run away. Nathan quietly keeps to the side. Children! For a long time now, our family has been striving to become nobles of the sword. Every noble of the Bronte family will gain a hereditary title. This is your grandfather's dying wish. Gloria sighs loudly. Then why am I here, Sir Robert? She's right. This is a Bronte matter. Wait until I finish, Stefan. I am still the head of this household. If you are truly so concerned about honor, show your father some respect. It can't be helped. Not all of us are noble. But we must be united as never before. We must work together to protect the reputation and wealth of this family. But you, Stefan, perpetually humiliate Gloria. Father, all I'm trying to do is put her in her place. You know perfectly well the consequences of any attention Gloria might attract. Our every step is being observed. The nobles will make pariahs of our family for all eternity if they remember Gloria's filthy origins and your reckless marriage to Lydia. Father turns red in the face, but with considerable effort he remains composed. That is so. Our grandfather did everything in his power to remedy your mistakes. Please, Father, don't repeat them. Gloria speaks up. I'm just trying to live, Sir Robert, but Stefan wants to lock me in a cage so nobody will ever lay eyes on me. That's not it at all. You are a lowborn, but you don't live by your lot. You do whatever it takes to your fancy. You're constantly grumbling about the order of things. Did you know, Father, that she defies all prohibitions by continuing to write poetry? As far as you're concerned, anyone who contradicts you is an insurgent. When will you grasp the idea that you may not argue with a nobleman? I am the heir of this family, and my word is your law. <coughs> Purple with rage, father slams his fist on the table. It is rare to see him so furious. Both your elder brother and sister instantly fall silent, frightened. Nathan shrinks into a corner. Hold your tongues, both of you. Let Paul speak. 
He has witnessed your quarrels. He should know what was it? He should know best of which of you is in the right. Damn it. <laughs> we gotta send her off to the gulag. <laughs> oh shit, I don't We're know. We're sending you to the ranch. Mm. It's difficult. It's hmm. What would I, I mean, do? I what would Milton do? <laughs> what would Paul do? Yeah. Well, exciting with Stefan is kind of weird. I mean, it's not, it's not we dislike Stefan, but he's not like... She doesn't really have much interest to us. Gloria is cool because she reads our substacks. <laughs> we like but, Gloria. But, but, uh, I mean, maybe she needs a vacation. You know, she's kind of tired of this. Yeah, time. but we're, we're, we're kind of burning through that wealth. But let's hope our profitable business. Look, can... look, she's, she's five. She's, look at that. She, she's got five love for us. She's not going to, like, die or whatever. Uh, yeah, it's just, you know, okay, we're, we're burning through wealth. It's okay. We'll be all right. We'll just, yeah, we'll learn more. That's right. You take a conciliatory tone. You note that the tempers are running too high. Your siblings would benefit from spending some time apart. They need to cool off, then try to settle their differences. From what you hear, the town of Valona in the southern part of the province has an excellent resort with healing springs. What if Gloria took a vacation there for a month to improve her health and have some rest by the sea? Gloria shakes her head hesitantly. Are you trying to get rid of me, Paul, so I won't be in your way? What am I supposed to do in some twins forsaken spa? You patiently explain to Gloria that she'll be able to enjoy some reading, find inspiration in contemplating the waves, and ponder on her future. And then when she comes back, she and Stefan will calmly discuss their issues. Finally, Gloria gives in. A trip to Valona will be costly. I'd like to know who will pay for it. Speaking first and foremost to your father, you argue that peace in the family is worth any expense. The two of you should indeed spend some time away from each other. Let it be as you suggested, Paul. Gloria, start packing. Stefan, please send a note to Valona and hire a carriage for your sister. Gloria reluctantly heads off to the coast. This trip forces the family to spend a hefty sum, but without the, con the constant bickering of your brother and sister, the tension at home quickly dissolves. With no need to keep an eye on Gloria, Stefan devotes himself to Anizate's social life. Gloria returns surprisingly serene. After a month in Valona, her temper has mellowed for a time. She is engrossed in her own affairs and does not draw her brother's ire. Poverty. Yeah, oh, we're, no. we are in poverty. The life of a pauper. But we gotta earn back that money. We look. It's the the print shop will make us money. Okay. It's it'll 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 be okay. All right. Um. The past few weeks in Anizate resemble your first years in the capital when you and Sophia were recruiting people to join the lot list. You were so full of hope and ambition back then. Slowly, you, began to, you begin to make useful friends and acquaintances in the city. Gendarmes, street peddlers, merchants, laborers, vagrants, and each of them requires a unique approach. The techniques you used in Eterna work here as well. You look for the people you need, plan secret meetings, and make sure everything is secure. Sophia delivers one ardent speech after another, berating the Imperial Order. But so far, only few people have, st have stayed with you after these meetings. You have to hunt for each new member all over the city. Commoners are too afraid. Only the most desperate or insane are ready to join you. There are two members in particular who stand out. One is Father Fouad, a creaky old priest with fire in his eyes. He introduces himself as a commoner who has chosen the preacher's path. Does this mean he is a new believer? Fouad scoffs at the question. I'll put it this way. The only words that are true are those the twins tell you themselves, and I've heard their voice plenty. But the priests who just cook up some nonsense and call it divine law, they're either crooks or fools, all of them. And Isatius is the biggest crook and fool of them all. But Jesus, he knows me, and he knows I'm right. So this is so Father Fouad is basically a Pentecostal. Um, oh man, look at him! Oh my shit, what a, what a wonderful joy. Most 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 uh, what is it? Uh, most well tended Pentecostal. You can find me in the phone book. Just dial my phone free number. You could do it any way you want. Just do it, by the way. Mm. Absolutely. Are you making fun of televangelists? Well, that's, I mean, well, you know, this televangelist, like the, the guy that died in the week of Ted Kaczynski and Sibia. Pat Robertson. Uh, Pat Robertson, yeah. And then there's like the like people who sell like, a, like water that will cure your arthritis, like on the street. And I mean, I mean, look at him. He's going to raise up his arms, lift up his arms. And like scream hallelujah, brother. 
You well, are cured. You are healed by the power of Christ. I compel arthritis to die. Yeah, yeah that's kind of like, yeah, that's kind of stuff like, that's pen getting into Pentecostal stuff, stuff like laying on hands and all that. I'm not qualified. It's cause... weird. It's it's weird. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely less of a, uh, like, physical miracles man. Yeah, I'm going to have to, like, recuse myself because I don't <laughs> want to say that physical miracles are impossible because through God all yeah, things yeah. are possible and through the Holy Spirit all things are possible. I, I agree with you, it's, absolutely. It's just, it's just I don't know what the what the conditions for that are. You know, I, I would say I am, I am uncomfortable with people who look like this laying their hands on yeah. me. And, yeah. You know, it, it would be one thing, for example, if there was, like, a mysterious like traveling itinerant priest who showed up at my door and like exactly. my daughter got cured of a of a sick I don't have a daughter my hypothetical daughter <laughs> got cured of a you know tumorous cancer just seemingly miraculously and he leaves Absolutely. and never says his name again that would be like that would I mean but then again that's that's like I don't know if that's appealing to human sensibilities it's, it's or a very it believable miracle yeah uh. you know so I, once again I don't want to say you know, and, and angels, you know, angels do exist. They do appear in human form. You could look at someone who looks like a person, but they could actually be an angel. That's, that's real. That's mm -hmm. attested to in mm -hmm. scripture. Um, but you uh, know, if you remember, there was, um, there was a stream where Ryan Turnipseed and like AA and a bunch of other people were discussing a bunch of streams actually, but they were discussing the history of American evangel American Protestantism really, but American evangelism especially. And there was a moment where I think Philosophicat began talking about uh, like visions and speaking in tongues and all of that stuff. And man, it was. Everyone kind of felt uncomfortable. Uh, and A was blunt. He said, he, he kind of said what he was thinking. But it's, I think there are like more, um, what would you call it? Like constrained ideologies where people are more somber. Where like, well, the magic of the world is sort of, it's only personal. You can't really film it or take a photo of it. That's why you can't take a photo of cryptids. Yeah. Or like little gnomes or whatever. And you can see the, the difference in regions. That maybe... Um, maybe like a German or even a Russian, really, would be more at home in a... Um, in a church that's beautiful, but that's like beautiful forever you know that it's it's drawn there it's a sculpture it's not beautiful in the sense of the priest coming there and reading his uh daily would you call it like all a prayer or addressing the crowd uh, where that person is there to talk to them but it's not he's not there to invoke god through him in that in that sense because everything because you're already there you're already communing with god and if you're talking to him right now you can't talk to him at the same time like with uh the, the priest and that's why like it's kind of weird to a lot of people who come from this tradition when they look at the evangelicals where they like perform miracles or they uh like fall down and they like convulse and they speak in tongues well, that's, because you're that's the pentecostals basically i mean it, it, there it are interrupts, evangelicals who do that, though. I think it interrupts your dialogue for, for those people. But I can totally see how a lot of people feel at home with this. And that's why I... Oh, that's why I have such a difficult time, like, even being in a church. Because I don't think that I'm, like, correct with this. I think that people who are there, they have gone through a journey or they have their own justifications. And I can't like say that this is either um like smart or dumb for well, them. Like Bobby, you know, you know the the, yeah? the the scripture says that um uh, God is not found through personal experience. He is not found through, you know, revelation or whatever. You know, even all that all of that can point you along the path 
God is found through proper argument. You know, God is God is mm, very God, <laughs> God is God is found through a proper application of intellect. Um because God gave us intellect for a reason. You know, he gave us intellect so that we could use it you know intellect in service of itself is useless we all know this. this is a dr talking point but like intellect in service of a proper goal is extremely useful this is why you know overthinking is a big problem for myself especially but for a lot of dr guys you know you try to think your way out of problems and it just doesn't work um but i'm gonna theory sell this exactly but it's like but it's like thinking when coupled to a goal and combined with action is you know not only is it not only is it uh, helpful it's just absolutely necessary you know god gave us brain so that we could understand cause and effect um do you know what very very interesting way of seeing the original sin and the uh like creation well and you know why did god have us process time linearly you know there's no like we're finding that time is a mutable thing however all humans mm -hmm. process time in a sort of linear fashion you know at least yeah. at least you know well there there so there are two ways humans process time there is subspecie eternitatis and intempore um subspecie eternitatis is basically you're kind of standing outside of time you're trying to you're basically trying to put yourself as though you are in the position god has where you see every contributing factor and every possible result um and every time you kind of think something out you logic something out you make predictions that's kind of what you're trying to do you're trying to ascertain a proper cause and effect um because obviously you wouldn't gamble on something that you wouldn't think would happen um every gambler even if it's only a small chance gambles on something that they think will happen um and that's where faith comes in but in tempore it just means you're in time you know you know thing a happens causes thing b you're seeing all of it play out in real time I'm, i would not venture to speak as to what god is what he can do however i don't believe that this is heretical or incorrect i believe one of the things that makes god omnipotent um well god is omnipotent uh and omni uh was it, omniscient like, self-evidently yeah. but one of the things that come with being omniscient is that god has a perfect understanding of all causes and all effects from all causes and how they all contribute to each other and affect each other and he can see causes and effects and things we can't even begin to comprehend however well, what about the five minute uh time traveling blacks you know, the i didn't do nothing well, he didn't do nothing. He really didn't do nothing because well, it's a completely different person. Five minutes. That's that's because blacks live in tempore. You know, they they uh. they. It is very difficult for them to understand things. You know, outside of time, except in very certain contexts, they can still do it and they can develop it. Um, they have the capacity for it. It's just very difficult for them to do. Um, and I think the project of trying to get them to do it on mass is, you know, what the wasp New Englanders yeah, tried to do, and it—it's horrifying, and it had horrible consequences that we are seeing now. Most expensive you know. commodity in history. Anyway, oh, um, but yeah, I'm, uh, we got we got ten we got ten minutes. We'll see if we can finish up with this. Uh, uh, you know, I'm counting my blessings because I found true happiness, man. Had he lived in any other city in the empire, he would already have been burned at the stake for these words. But here in Anizate, Fouad freely preaches in various taverns and squares. Moreover, the old man is well educated, so you hire him as a typesetter and even let him sleep in the storeroom. When the time comes to assemble a mob or spread some rumors, he will surely come in handy. The other is Alida Sirin, who works at the print shop as a bookbinder. A quiet and innocuous young woman, she nevertheless believes in your words and your struggle with all her heart. And her innocent appearance hires and hides an ardent will. I've met women like this. This is like dear woman Anya Taylor Joy has joined our group. So, so there. This is actually like a type of woman, like the really yeah. quiet librarian bookstore. They're they're always around mm -hmm. books. The very quiet, but like you can tell that there's like something beneath it that it, they they have exactly. no real external way of expressing. Why would she choose to fight against the empire when Alita explains you do not expect to hear cold steel in her voice? My sister was hanged in Eterna after the trial of the Fifty. I know I might sound like a weepy little girl, but I'm not looking for pity. I just want her murderers to hang. That's it. 
Sophia's speeches are always brimming with passion and sincerity. She speaks out against the injustice of the Empire and calls for people to fight with such intensity that sometimes you find yourself getting swept up by her words, nodding along with the rest. When she speaks, Felipe's plans and the secret chancellery disappear, replaced by a vision of a new world where justice and freedom reign. But this illusion passes every time. And when it does, the truth oh, about your conspiracy... Oh, shit, that's Ayn Rand. <laughs> always feels more crushing than ever. You give all of your employees a day off today. Sir Felipe Alfaro is coming to Anizate. Your print shop is the first place he will visit. Sophia stuffs tobacco in her pipe over and over again, trying to look calm behind the smoke. You hear the sound of hooves and wheels on cobblestones. A carriage comes to a halt outside. A man walks past the windows and knocks at the heavy front door with the handle of his cane. You open it hurriedly. Felipe is not alone. He is accompanied by a man with sinewy arms in the face of a predator. Once inside, the secret chancellery advisor slowly takes off his cloak, then inspects the premises with care. Sophia was right. Excellent choice. Well done, Bronte. I have my doubts about you, but these doubts are gradually being eased. You are indeed a man of many talents. Speaking of talents, allow me to introduce you to Oliver Moss, an old friend of mine. I brought him all the way from Eterna to help you out. His skills are even more unusual than yours, Bronte. It's amazing how much a person can learn to do what he, when he's well paid. <laughs> Oliver grins at Felipe's words. The toothy smile cuts through his face like a gruesome scar. You flatter me, Sir Felipe, but you're right. Coin works wonders. Felipe chuckles at that. He produces a small flask from his pocket and takes a little sip. But you, Sophia, you disappoint me. I expected to see a functioning organization. But I am told that, you, that what you have here is not a secret society, but a miserable rabble of the worst people in the city. Just look at the self-proclaimed <laughs> priest, Fouad. We are an anizate, this hotbed of heresy and rebellious ideas... How come you aren't able to find skillful conspirators here? I need a nice little... This is how it happens. The worst people in the city are the first to join any fucking dissenter organization. It's true. That's why That's why the um, kind of a lot of the truths are first adopted by like retards and crazy people. Well, that's what that's uh, what prophets were in the Bible. They were like crazy people and they attracted a lot of crazy people, you know? If if you're content yeah. with your society, why would you be a dissenter? You know, I mean, maybe the leader isn't crazy, but the first people he finds are definitely insane because everyone, everyone else is afraid of, for good reason, of new ideas. And if even if if they're like truths, uh, if if like like HBD, you know, human biodiversity. I mean, like let's let's think 20, 30, 40 years ago, you would have had like a weird ass uh, internet bulletin board. Full of people who live in like hoarder buildings, eating peas out of the can with like tinfoil hats, talking about this. No, you just have Tucker Carlson. You know. So it always starts with that. Indeed. I need a nice little revolt that's easy to suppress. I need a network of spies to dig up dirt on anyone who, might, who may stand in our way. Is that too much to ask? You did this job perfectly well in Eterna. What's the matter, Sophia? Can't you do the same thing again? Sir Felipe, Bronte and I are going out of our way to get more people into our ranks, but things are not looking too good for us right now. The province has a new overseer. Citizens are hopeful they expect change. So the only people who come to us are from the very bottom of life. This rabble is dangerous. They will ruin my plan. And they will bring you and Bronte to the gallows. And this time I won't be able to do anything for you. Get rid of them and find conspirators who can be trusted with real work. I have too, en too many enemies here in Anizate. The local magistrate alone is a huge thorn in my side. You have to act faster. Time is of the essence. Or maybe you have more important things to do than serving the Empire. We are doing everything in our power, Sir Felipe. But in order to prepare your plan, we must recruit as many people as possible. And this is what we are doing. Don't try my patience, Sophia. I said get rid of the rabble, find real conspirators, carefully vet each and every one of them. Sophia lowered the feds giving dissident right guys advice on how to build dissident right organizations. What did Sandy write the essay about the, um, the ideas people, the guys who did the, the experiments? Yeah, Tavistock. Yeah, exactly. A massive part of the Anglo-Israeli um, transatlantic elite. I mean, the scariest thing in that essay, in the in the Tavistock, is that post Tavistock you don't know what is Tavistock and what's not, uh, and I think that's their biggest accomplishment. Really. Exactly. Well, that's and that really it's just an extension of Perfidious Albion. That's all it is. It's just it's the, the only thing British intelligence is good at is psyops, and it's the only thing they really need to be good at in order to impose their their rule of the world they don't they're not actually good at things like assassinations or anything like that 
They're just good at desinformatia. Even the idea of desinformatia is kind of a um, is kind of a misnomer because the Russian intelligence doesn't do it as well as English intelligence. No, no, um, they don't. Although I'll, I'm going to tell you a little secret: when the Wagner thing was happening, every single meme channel that Closington has and that he reposts from, and that a lot of people in the DR, like on Telegram, frequent. They got. They were Russians. They they posted Russian memes, like like memes in Russian. They spoke in Russian. They changed their names, like Wagner's company and all that stuff. Like voluntarist memes, Russian channel changed their name to Wagner's Battalion um, and then um... changed it back. Like it was pretty funny how like a lot of the meme space is actually like Russians making memes in English. I'm I'm uh... just gonna avoid that. I'm just not gonna touch that with a fifteen foot pole. <laughs> um Sophia lowers her head, unable to further argue with her powerful advisor. Felipe suddenly turns to you. Bronte, you're the main recruiter for the society. What do you say? Can you do this job for me? Agree with Felipe. Side with Sophia. Hmm. Oh, oh shit. No Sophia, Sophia, Sophia. Give me, give me, give me that, uh, what is it, the, that, um, come on, how does the phrase go? The rebellious pussy <laughs> makes the man go nuts. What was it? That, 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 um, uh, that 1920s flapper pussy got a man acting strange. Yeah, you take a quick exactly. look at Sophia, she nods to you faintly. You look at Sir Felipe straight in the eyes and say firmly, Sophia's right, you cannot gather an underground movement if you disdain the support of paupers and vagabonds, or as Sir Advisor calls them, rabble. After all, you declare, you do not need to prepare a real uprising against the government. All you need is a small riot of commoners doomed to fail. And for this purpose, these poor bastards will do. Your words of support reinvigorate Sophia. She continues to argue her case. That's my point exactly, Sir Felipe. Felipe frowns in disappointment. If you are both so confident, so be it. Recruit any fanatics or street scum you want. As long as they are helping us reach our goal, I don't care. But remember that you will pay with your lives for any mistake. None of this rabble should be aware of our true purpose. I advise you against testing my patience. You're one straw away from breaking the horse's back. Speaking of straws, I believe your secret society still needs a name, right? The last straw will do just fine. It's simple, grim, pompous, the lowborn ought to like it. Oliver, I'm leaving you in the care of our rebels. Show them how real secret chancellor agents get things done. Felipe d downs the last of his flask and walks out of the print shop. Sophia shares a word with you before following him. Thanks for backing me up. If we have to do Felipe's dirty work, let's at least do it on our way, right? With that, Sophia waves goodbye, scowls quietly at Oliver Moss, and walks out of the door. You are left alone with Oliver. The sinewy man chuckles. We're going to get along just fine, Bronte. Don't you worry. He looks like the CIA guy in uh, Dark Knight uh, Dark Knight Rises. Or yeah. The, um, I was looking kind of dumb with my finger and my thumb in the shape of a hook on my belt loops. <laughs> well, the blade starts coming and it won't stop coming. Yeah, the... Uh, uh, have you heard that song? I have not, um, yeah. unfortunately. You haven't heard that part? Yeah, I'll, I'll send it to you. It's great. Uh, there's a well, couple of songs that, that some people made like based on like two scenes in Dark Knight Rises. Well, Bobby, um, I think we've come up to about our two-hour mark, so I think this is a good, a, as good a spot. To, Wonderful. Good a spot to stop as any. Um, thank you very much for joining me, Mr. Bobby, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for uh, joining yeah. us this morning, and we'll we'll try to we'll try to keep this going again because we got to finish this game. Thank you. We've got to finish you, the Paul. game. It's, we got to finish this game, then we got to start another one because there's so much to do. Oh man, I've got big plans. I I, I get big you have, plans. I had I, I yeah. understand you have big plans, Bobby, but I also have big responsibilities coming over yeah, the horizon. It's, so uh, it's so true. we'll see. We'll, we'll see. We'll manage. We'll manage. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you very much. I hope you all have a very good morning. Yep.